Welcome to Booked, where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Livia Snedden. Uh, we're back after a, uh, a brief hiatus. We're a few days late on this, but that's totally my fault. Because um, now that I'm rolling in this big podcast money, I can afford to take vacations to beautiful places like New Orleans. This is this is what I get for, for trusting you with the... Uh... Patreon funds. Did you, ever, did you ever wonder how the fuck does he go to New Orleans like <laughs> twice a year? This is how. Because I'm rolling in the. I have my own jet. Just flies me there all off the Patreon funds. So thank you, Patreon contributors. Um, wow, we're <laughs> the, doing better than I thought we were. Yeah. No, no, we're not doing that well at all. Keep yeah. keep working. Yeah. Um, seriously, though, uh, apologies for the late episode. Um, I just couldn't bring myself to read this book while I was on vacation. So I basically read it on the plane on the way back and then uh, a little bit uh, the last couple nights. So uh, this week we are reviewing Noir uh, by Christopher Moore. Um, I will say... It's an interesting couple of weeks because this week and next week are two of my highest anticipated books of this year. So really, it's kind of like an uptick. In, I'm not saying I'm not excited about other books, but these are really probably two of the three books I'm most looking forward to reading. Yeah, and they drop like literally a week away from each other. We're, we're doing this review actually very timely. By the time this episode is posting, um, I'm going to do my weird future calendar math um the book releases tomorrow from when we're reading this i mean reviewing this but um yesterday by the time you're listening to it so very timely review of christopher moore's noir um which we've had a copy of a review copy of for like two months and it's just been like teasing me and i and i didn't read it until this weekend so um and then unbury carol actually released a few days ago and we'll be reviewing it next week. So we got about a week uh, after the release date of that. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that, too. It's like a few years ago, I would have killed to have a Christopher Moore book like two months ahead of time. And, and now it just sucked. I had to wait like up until the yeah. release date, which really I wound up reading it like four days before I could have if I was a regular um, peon <laughs> like everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. I still felt good about having it. And wh- I mean, I guess that might come up next episode when we're talking about unbury carol and how that went um yeah yeah right <laughs> now let's see let's see something for next episode so um, why don't you go ahead and tell folks a little bit about christopher moore christopher moore in addition to having an excellent author bio is the author of 14 previous novels including lamb the stupidest angel fool sacre Bleu, a dirty job and the serpent of venice um you've read all 14 correct i've read everything by christopher moore I, I think I'm still missing one. Fluke. You didn't like Fluke. Well, I didn't like Fluke, but I think there's another one I didn't read. I want to know. No. It was Island of the Sequin Love Nun. I don't know. Oh, I probably won't yeah. get back around to it. Um, but yeah, I didn't like Fluke at all. So there you go. So negative one star for this book for him writing that Fluke. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, if you liked all the other ones, it was just an anomaly. Well, yeah, it was a Fluke. It was an, I would say, I would say anomaly. Like, <laughs> the obvious, anyway. <laughs> Yeah. Here is, uh, I was going to say a little bit, but uh, buckle Ooh, in, folks. Yeah. It's, it's a long one. Here's a, a little bit about Noir. San Francisco, summer 1947. A dame walks into a saloon. It's not every afternoon that an enigmatic, comely blonde named Stilton, like the cheese, walks into the scruffy gin joint where Sammy Two Toes Tiffin tends bar. It's love at first sight, but before Sammy can make his move, an Air Force general named Remy arrives with some urgent business. Because when you need something done, Sammy is the guy to go to. He's got the connections on the street. Meanwhile, a suspicious flying object has been spotted up the Pacific coast in Washington State near Mount Rainier, followed by a mysterious plane crash in a distant patch of desert in New Mexico that goes by the name Roswell. But the real weirdness is happening on the streets of the city by the bay. When one of Sammy's schemes goes south and the cheese mysteriously vanishes, Sammy is forced to contend with his own dark secrets and more than a few strange goings on if he wants to find his girl. Think Raymond Chandler meets Damon Runyon with more than a dash of Bugs Bunny and the Looney Tunes All-Stars. It's all very, very noir. It's all very, very Christopher Moore. All right, let's do a little bit of a, a synopsis analysis. Um, I, I feel like, I, I mean, obviously it's very accurate, but I feel like some of the stuff that's mentioned 
the way it, the way it's the way this is laid out makes it seem like some of the stuff that's mentioned is is something that you get you get to right away, and really some of that other stuff like the flying object and all that like doesn't really happen until you pass the half halfway point of the book. Yeah, and I feel that it's a little I don't know. I don't. I don't want to say dishonest. Again, this is almost like that thing, and we've talked about it before, where the person who wrote this really didn't read the book. Yeah, which is fine because you know whatever. But so Sammy is. So it's just because when you need something done, Sammy is the guy to go to. He's got the connections on the street. Sammy's not really a guy to go to for anything. Yeah, like he's given this this task because. I mean, we can get into it. The straw. I'll get into it now. But basically, he's he's uh, asked to um, procure some women who are not prostitutes, like the exact opposite of the guy you need. Like, he, the, can you bring some wholesome women <laughs> to this thing? So that doesn't lead me to believe he's the guy who's got the connections on the street, because the street connection guy, you know, would get you the hookers, but not the 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 girls next door, so to speak. So I don't know. Some of this is a little off. Yeah, I mean, you have to paint. I guess they kind of had to paint the whole picture without spoiling it. I don't know, but yeah, again, one of those misleading synopses where I, I would have painted it differently, but then I can't tell you how many times we're reviewing and, and like we're dancing around the stuff and we're like, man, I really wish we could talk about these other things. Um, that's true. So maybe, maybe that's just the nature of making a synopsis. You have to make it sound, you have to include all the elements, but without spoiling things. I, know. Uh, I did not read the synopsis, by the way, until just now. So, yeah. I, I, so as I'm reading this book, um, I want to get into the fact that uh, Christopher Moore books, essentially all of them, and if not all, maybe all but one or two, have some real fantastical or magical yeah. element to them. And this one was trucking along at a really good pace without that. But I guess if I would have read the synopsis, <laughs> I would have said, oh, there might be some alien thing since there's a Roswell mention. And y- you know what I mean? So I was like, oh, this is like a straight Christopher Moore book with like no bullshit, no weird magical imps, no vampires. No, yeah. you know what I mean? Like all of it's just like a straight, uh, although funny and, and, you know, whatever, maybe unrealistic, but in that kind of humorous sense um, book. And yeah, the, the, you still get some some a little extra in there. So I guess we can do our our normal thing where uh, we just kind of give you the story up to the point where it's going to spoil stuff. Um, it essentially starts out with Sammy going to the bar, right? Yep. And um, doing his regular. Here's what I'll say. Um, like Livius was saying, very straight, kind of not not the fantastical. Christopher Moore stuff that you're, you you expect for a good chunk of the beginning of the book. So, um, oh, it starts out actually. There's kind of a flash forward moment where, um, oh yeah, 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 you're right. Where Sammy finds his boss Sal dead. Um, of apparently of what Sam, Sammy knows, it's a it's a snake bite from a black mamba, and um, and he's freaking out because there's an empty crate that the black bomba came in and a dead boss and <laughs> he doesn't know where the snake is so he's worried that like you know he's going to get attacked by this snake and so at the beginning of the book we're we're confronted with you know his he he's worried that he's going to get in trouble because he ordered this he he bought this snake and um uh you know it killed his boss and and people are going to think that he had motive to kill his boss and then we c- cut to you know, he's just showing up for work and like just learning about him and the dame walks into the bar like it says in the beginning of the synopsis. I feel like um, we've talked about this before on the podcast, but I, I want to bring it up again. I very rarely even remember that opening flash forward scene in a book. So oh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, like and, and in this book, I, I'm I'm going to go and just say I don't think it served any purpose. Um. Yeah, that's tricky because we read it. So, like, I'm wondering. right? No, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I, well, yeah, right. So, I guess my point is, I'd forgotten so much about it that it wasn't even such a pivotal moment that I'm trying to figure out how everyone got there. Right. 
So, um, and to be fair, we should say we did read an uncorrected proof. We're not even sure if this is what went to press. That's a good point. That's so, good point. Uh, but I, I just, I don't know. When you mentioned that, I was like, oh yeah, that was there. And I'm trying to think like, what was the point of that being there? So even after having read the book, I'm like, I don't really understand why we saw that as early on as we did. I mean, it could just be that he wanted to start out with some drama. Cause like, you know, the first quarter of the book is yeah. really just like everyday hijinks. Yeah. All right. So Sammy gets to work and he meets, um, he meets this woman. This woman walks in the bar and sits down and, you know, turns every head in the bar and stuff. And, and he gets talking to her and she's mentioned in the synopsis. Uh, her name is uh, Stilton. And she says, like the cheese. Now, I did not know Stilton was a cheese. Neither does anybody else in this story except for Stilton herself. I knew it was a cheese. Really? Yeah. How much cheese do you eat? Eat lots of cheese. <laughs> Do you really? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I do too. Like American and mozzarella, maybe some Swiss. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, have you ever had the mac and cheese from? Um, we're gonna get very uh, Midwest white person. The mac and cheese at Panera. I am not that white. Oh, all right, I I love it. I eat it a lot, and it's made with Gruyere cheese. It's delicious. Okay, is Stilton cheese any good? Have you ever eaten Stilton cheese? I've had Stilton, but I, I don't I don't remember off the top of my head the exact. Like affected gotcha. that on me. <laughs> All right. Um, so as mentioned, the synopsis: her and her and Sammy kind of hit it off. But but the best part of this, and and I mean, there are just like every Christopher Moore book. I, I'm I'm never like really in love with the story, but I'm in love with the characters and the interaction. Um, for the rest of the book, he refers to her when he's talking about her or narrating about her as the cheese. Which I just found endearing the first time and like the hundredth time. Like it's just it's like one of my favorite yeah. things about this book. Yeah, it was good throughout, um, and it it kept reminding me of um, every time I, I read the cheese, I kept thinking need a cheese from uh, yeah. Secondhand Soul. That's so good, but um, adorable. Yeah, so that scene actually does a lot of setting up for the story because it's in that scene also that. Uh, Sammy's boss, Sal Gabelli, um, comes in with, uh, General Remy, who is a, he's a general in what? The Navy? Is he a Navy uh, general? I don't think so. Cause he's remember. in New Mexico. I don't think they have the Navy in New Mexico. Uh, whatever. I, I know that later on in the book, he's explaining the guy's a general and then someone was surprised by it and he's like, well, it was this general. And they're like, oh, like it was no big deal to be a general of whatever. <laughs> but anyway, um. Sal shows up with uh, General Remy, and that's when um, Sal asks Sammy to get these girls because, and this isn't spoiling anything, um, General Remy is trying to get into a very exclusive club for rich people called the Bohemians, and um, they're having like a camping trip. <laughs> it sounds stupid, they're, but like... Yeah, they're, they're having... well. I don't know this, and, and Christopher Moore does some explaining at the at the end of the book. Um, and the Bohemians were a real group of people who was all uh, they're all like the super ultra rich, ultra powerful um, yeah. people. So they're like the Illuminati or or that type of group. And uh, those people always, I mean, in in literature and fiction, always have like these weird retreats, like in the middle of yeah. nowhere, where they can have their secret meetings. So it's not, you know, necessarily an original thing. And, and Christopher Moore says that the Bohemians did have a group that would meet at whatever camp that it, it's in. So yeah, yeah, he's trying to get in by bringing them something they don't normally get because they're rich and powerful. They always get call girls or whatever. So he's trying to um, grease the wheels. Um, for his entry into the Bohemians by bringing a bunch of normal dames, uh, you know, kind of like your regular uh, girl next door, you know, not uh, yeah. not lady of the evening. Because um, anybody can get a hooker, I think, is his idea, right? So he wants right, yeah, to bring him yeah. something special. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, and then Sal immediately dumps this on Sammy, <laughs> this job, because Sal's just a scumbag. So Sal has no access to these people, but... but um, <laughs> Sammy might, so the job immediately gets dumped on him to to procure regular dames for this uh, for this thing. I like that um, it's acknowledged that Sammy pretty much kn or Sal, sorry, that Sal pretty much knows that no one will talk to him, and that's why he knows he can't get these women. Um, that's pretty funny. 
So that's a lot of the setup is and we are we're also introduced to one of, uh, one of the bigger characters and, and in Christopher Moore true Christopher Moore form like we we have our main core of probably four or five characters that we see the most but there is always a supporting cast of, mm-hmm. of interesting uh, an interesting variety of characters and Eddie Moo shoes is one of the um, characters that is also in this first couple chapters scene where he meets Stilton and he meets the general and he also his buddy Eddie Mushu's is there. Um and he's just this Chinese guy who is basically there um as like a he calls him a business partner. Um and I think they actually kind of every now and then it seems like they kind of hatch a scheme here and there to mm-hmm. like make money and stuff like that. But um it seems like he's just kind of like a buddy who uh when they're not working they hang out and stuff like that. Yeah, and Eddie is really the one that introduces us to like the the Chinese underground culture. I guess really, um, this all takes place in San Francisco, and and the Chinese culture plays a significant role. Yeah, in in the rest of the story, some of it we won't get into, but uh, one of the the characters that's important Eddie introduces us to is Uncle Ho, who, who yeah. is his uncle, who's uh, estranged <laughs> from the family. <laughs> Because it was alleged that this uncle had sexual relations with a cat, and it, it's never, uh, it's never, it's never gone away. He was accused of this when he was a child, and, and the family is basically, um, you know, kind of the black sheep of the family. Um, but he's an important underground character that can get a lot of things done, and, and of course, through the course of the story, Sammy um, needs his help a significant uh, number of times. Yep. So, and I think we can kind of like fast forward a little bit on this. The the story has like obviously several plots that you know wind around. The big one being um, Sammy's budding relationship with Stilton, the cheese, um, and what happens with trying to get the ladies for um, Sal and the general, and uh, the general kind of has his own subplot story that becomes a lot bigger later in the book that we probably won't talk much about. Um, and, and so like the lines are, are, are pretty much defined of, of what's about to what's so that's basically act one is that's the setup. And now things are happening. I want to touch on a couple other characters and then I probably I get into um, away from the rest of the story. There is an unnamed character in this, uh, in this story. That's just goddamn adorable. And, and he is the kid. He is, uh, is he nine years old, I think? And yeah, he is the, like the neighbor of Sammy, who Sammy uses as an alarm clock and to kind of uh, uh, run little errands for him, go pick shit up from the store. But Sammy also kind of looks after him. His mom is uh, apparently uh, uh, a whore, I guess. <laughs> you know, lots of guys coming and going, and she doesn't really look after the kids. So Sammy, he has keys to Sammy's place and Sammy always makes sure there's like cereal and milk for him. If he's hungry and go in there and eat and uh, and do that kind of stuff. But this fucking kid, man, again, much like the cheese, there is not a moment this kid appears in this story that is not just uh, just heartwarmingly adorable. Yeah, the the kid um, has a little gimmick. The character has a little gimmick where um, Sammy's always kind of trying to keep the kid from saying cocksucker all the time and so the kid when he's describing people he'll just use random words and um in, and and this happens for for a long time in the book and, and it eventually comes out that that's his way of trying to not say cocksucker so he'll just call you like he'll call you like a davenport but like in a in like it sounds like it's a, like a really Yep. Like a bad thing to be. Yep. Yeah. Those guys are just a bunch of stinking Davenports yeah. is what they are, you know, that kind of thing. And then when Sammy tries to explain to him what the word means, he just immediately calls Sammy a liar. He never believes just, him, yeah. Yeah. So. It's like, no, it's not. You don't know anything. Yeah. Oh, my God. And I'm telling you, it, it never got old. It never fucking nope. got old. I was like, you know, it's like saying, I was like, this is going to get old. And then I'm flipping, you know, I'm in the last pages of the book, and I'm like, this still hasn't gotten old. How has this not gotten old yet? It's like 30 times it's happened. Yep. Yeah. And even, yeah, even past the point where it's explained why the kid's doing that, which is a little bit touching and heartwarming. Um, hilarious. Yeah. So that kid was good. Um, 
I want to point out earlier in the book, uh, there's a character uh, with the last name Bakker who's a merchant marine, and he's hanging out in the bar in one of the early scenes, and he's talking about how he's on this ship that um, I don't know what a merchant marine is, but that's what he was. But um, he's on this ship that's transporting like a lot of animals, and um, offhandedly mentions like a black mamba snake, and later on. Um, Sammy and Eddie are at this noodle place and they witness this. And, and I don't know how I'm, I'm assuming this isn't real. This according to Christopher Moore, this is real. So they witness this thing where this box is brought out and a box or whatever. Um, and it's basically this box full of snakes that are like writhing around and, um, the the bar like the I guess bartender server or whatever it is is like like getting I don't even know how to explain it he's just like doing like cupfuls of snake piss and selling it to the people for like twenty bucks a glass yeah and the idea is that drinking this snake <laughs> snake piss is gonna um, give you like a really strong erection. Like it makes you like virile and stuff like that. So these guys are just making throwing tons of money and drinking this snake piss. And so Sammy puts kind of two and two together and decides, Hey, we can make, we can make a killing with uh, the snake piss thing. We just have to get this black mamba from the guy who I know who has the ship full of animals. And so that's how the snake is brought into the picture. I, uh, I didn't hear a word you said, and I'm going to explain why. I tried to look this up because I believe in the afterward he says that at least according to Google, this is still a thing. Um, the first Google result, first of all, I somehow hit the caps lock. So if I ever tried to type Chinese <laughs> into my search bar, in capitals, Chinese snake urine is going to come up as like predictive because <laughs> I searched for it. So I have to never do that, like when I'm around, like in mixed company or, or whatever. The next time uh, you're trying to go out for like a nice Chinese meal with like yeah. coworkers or something. Yep. Uh, but the first <laughs> article that came up, I'm not even going to click on this. I'm just going to read it to you. It's from Reuters from 2012. Urine soaked eggs, a spring taste treat in China City. Now, this is Reuters. I believe they're a fairly credible yeah. news source. It is the key ingredient in virgin, and this is in quotes, virgin boy eggs, a local tradition of soaking and cooking eggs in the urine of young boys, preferably below the age of 10. What is happening? So, the second thing that uh, that came up, I don't know if, if you ever owned a turtle. Yeah. All right. The second article is from National Geographic, also a reputable news source. Yeah. And it says turtles urinate via their mouths. Peeing out of the mouth helps species stay healthy, scientists suggest. The Chinese softshell turtle is the first animal known to pee via its mouth. So if you're one of those people who thinks it's adorable <laughs> to kiss your little pet turtle, just be warned, it might urinate from its mouth. It's going to piss on you from its mouth. That's, uh, uh, hey, the wonders of the internet right there. Ugh. All right. I have no idea what we were talking about. Were we reviewing a book? Like my brain is like just broken now. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of the other characters, I don't know. I mean, there's there's the the government men in black um, that make numerous appearances and, and essentially appear everywhere. Every character we mentioned at some point has an interaction with them if it's yeah. on scene or uh, or off scene. You know, you just hear that they were there. Um, there's a man named Thelonious Jones who's also a great character. Yeah. He is. Um, and, and I thought like, he's a, he's a fun character. He's a good character. But one of the things that, and, 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 and um, this is more just me talking to you. It's not gonna make any sense to anybody else. At one point, um, Thelonious is a, a really, really big black guy. And at one point he refers to Sammy as his white boy. Yeah. <laughs> and I, you know, I felt out of place, but I felt like that was going to have a payoff and the payoff for that. When they explain that one little yep. throwaway line, that's in the very beginning of the book, I don't know, whatever, 20% of the way of the book, like 70 or 80% of when they explain it again, absolutely adorable. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. That, so that was one, that was one of my favorite characters. He, uh, he's not super prominent in the book, but he's, he's there throughout. And, um, he's just like, imagine if a gentle giant had the c capability of suddenly not being super gentle. Um, but like, he's just this like 
really nice dude who worked with Sammy and he had some of his backstory at one point. Um, but he's he's kind of slow and people make fun of him and call him a dummy and stuff like that. But like, he, yeah, just a great character. Very entertaining. Um, and yeah, very good stuff. Um, and then, like I said, the rest of the characters, I don't know how important any of them are. I do want to ask Rob, though, there is a cop named Puki O'Hara. Yeah. Um, what is a turbo racist? Oh, <laughs> that's how Rob described him in our in our character notes. Um, <laughs> I wasn't sure if I did if this is just something I, I missed. No, I, I, that's a new thing I'm doing where when I'm trying to like make something sound more than just like your average amount of something, I put the word <laughs> turbo in front. Like okay. so, All this right. guy is like super rich. So like to to explain what so I'll I'll explain to the listeners what turbo turbo racist is by explaining a little bit about Pookie O'Hara. He is a cop who, um, when the African American population of San Francisco uh, kind of skyrocketed during um, World War Two ish, I think if I remember correctly from reading everything, um, he wanted to keep like his neighborhood white he wanted to keep his area his beat i'm guessing white and so he would literally like beat people out of the neighborhood or you know he was he was just a bad dude and he was super 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 racist so he's a turbo racist i have to remember throwing turbo in front of things now Uh, and pretty much i said rounds out the cast there's a few other people um but they're not super important to the story um what is important to the story just how goddamn adorable everybody is. <laughs> I got to say that, and, and we'll probably talk about, we'll talk in generalities about, I'm sure we're going to size this up against other Christopher Moore books. Um, the love story was super sweet. Yeah, and, and in sizing it up against other Christopher Moore books, um, and again, it's it's hard to say because I've read, like I said, whatever, 12 or 13 of them over the last 10 years or mm-hmm. whatever it's been. I would say that Sammy and the cheese are my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think it's because in, in a way this book is, and we're going to talk about how I'm, I'm completely wrong about this, but I'm a little more down to earth. I feel like you said, there's not that supernatural element so much. Um, uh, not as, not as present in this book. I feel that way too. And I feel like it allowed the book to be more about those two. And then just like you see the chaos and the weird things that are happening around them. Um, so I, I, but again, it's also just the book I just read. So maybe it's cause it's the, you know, freshest <laughs> in my mind. Yep. Uh, it bears yep. talking a little bit about the hinted at things in the synopsis. They name Roswell mm-hmm. and, um, uh, you know, a, a flying object of suspicious flying objects. So it is heavily hinted at in the synopsis that, um, with these men in black and the Roswell thing, that there's uh, and the timing lines up right with um, the mm-hmm. the crash in Roswell. Yeah, that this has something to do with um, the UFO crash in Roswell. So that does get kind of embroiled into it, and it's something that like definitely drives a good chunk of the story. But we just probably want to step over it at some point to spoiler talk to talk about. I do want to say in the afterward, I really like that he laid out how he came up with the concept for this um this book yeah so i'm not usually a big fan of afterwards but i did read this one um because it started off with yeah i wanted to write a book you know i kind of had an idea i wanted to be a noir story but i wasn't sure when to set it and i was talking about it with my agent and somehow we settled on 1947 he's like so i googled 1947 and the first thing that came up was the roswell crash so he had no con no like desire yeah. to put that <laughs> in there but it's like the first thing that came up yeah. so i thought that that was uh an interesting insight, you know, because when you think about these stories, you very rarely um, get the, you know, well, how'd you come up with the story or whatever? And sometimes you don't care. Sometimes the story is just the kind of story that doesn't, you know, you're not interested in how someone got to something this weird, right? So right. this is kind of weird and quirky and stuff. So you have to be like, so did you, you know, like, we could have gone and said, yeah, so he was kind of looking at this Roswell thing and thinking, like, how do I just bring this into somebody, a normal person's life, right? But it could happen completely the opposite way. Yeah. And like, it, it, like, ooh, I guess I have to include that, too. <laughs> yeah. And then it becomes a central part of the story. Yeah. I will say that I completely forgot what I was just going to say. 
there are moments of like more gravity in in the story that I, I feel are worth mentioning because it takes place you know pretty much right after World War Two ends and everything. There's um there's layers to to all the like all the characters. Nobody at that time wasn't affected by the war. I'm guessing right. And so um, some of our backstory that we get for Sammy and and the cheese and um, and people like that involve what happened to them as they were, you know, the the country was going to war and just like the feelings of, you know, loving people you lose or, you know, wanting to serve your country, the shame of not being able to serve your country. There was lots of themes of that that were like very serious and, and, you know, made me th- think about um, like the individual effect. Like, cause like world war two, you think just like, it's so massive that you just think about what it did to the world. And I, I personally don't really think very often of what it did to individual people. And I think this book did a great job of, of working that into the story too. Yeah. And, and I, you know, again, learned some things, right? Like I had no idea that women were doing jobs that were traditionally men's jobs during world war two, you know, the Tilly, uh, the cheese and, and, um, her friend, you know, were, were like working in like welding and stuff yeah. because all of the able-bodied men <laughs> essentially were, were off to war. Mm-hmm. So women took on these roles and then were immediately dismissed in favor of the men when they came back. Yeah. Which is uh, which is fascinating, and I, I had no idea. I mean, I'm not much on on history as a as a subject, um, and, and I'm sure I have some friends who I, we, we collectively have a friend right who's like went to college and studied history and is a huge <laughs> buff, and he'd be like, "You fucking idiots!" Of course, that's what happened, you know. Yeah. But I I didn't know that, and I did find some of that <laughs> stuff uh, fascinating. I to a degree knew that, but it was it was a nice it was portrayed in a very in a, I, I like the way that it was portrayed. I want to say that. Something was very, very briefly brought up that I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to go back to, I think, the original one of the original times I called Livius jokingly a bigot apologist. <laughs> That's when you were. Oh, one of the times you were joking about it. This should oh, be interesting. Yeah, because yeah. um, World War Two was when the Japanese internment camps happened <laughs> in uh, especially uh, specifically in California. And um, there was one. <laughs> One episode a long time ago. I think it was one of the, I think it was Amped, that um, that book with the the people who get like robot parts, robot parts. Oh, yeah. Um, and Livius, you, <laughs> I think you meant to say internment camps, but you said appar- you said apparently there were concentration camps or something yeah. along those lines, and then yep. I jokingly called you a Holocaust denier. So that was briefly brought up um but just like a line a throwaway mm-hmm. line during throughout the book but yeah he did a pretty good job of you know going through the whole what what I, what world like the effects of world war ii can i also tell you that i had no idea that in the 1940s i, I guess if you would ask me I, w- I would have said yeah i'm sure that's a thing but it never would occur to me that there are um female drag clubs and then yeah. apparently that's where lesbians hung out at. Yeah. Yeah. So to explain, there is a <laughs> character who is not a central character, but actually reflects uh, and, and displays something that, again, I didn't know. And that, that was interesting. There is a, uh, a a woman in this that dresses like a man and runs a club where there are women dressed like men um, all the time. And I, I didn't know this was a thing. And, and I would have I, I mean, I was a little shocked to hear that this was a thing in the forties when that didn't seem to be something that would be terribly acceptable, at least not the way that I view 1947 through my, my, (laughs) you know, being born 30 years after that lens. So, (laughs) um, yeah, yeah. Um, through my previous work as, um, working in, working for a gay newspaper and before I, I'm going to cut off your question that you probably would ask is the gay, the newspaper was, 100% 100% gay content. Um, doing not, little, not the newspaper itself the, was yeah, gay. I think we yeah, talked. Yeah, we talked yeah. about this before. Yeah, I had to, I had to cut that one off at the pass. Um, I a part of it was like doing history, like uh, like help with a history project where um, they were putting together information about like Chicago's history, um, dating back to like the time of like Abraham Lincoln. And so I caught I caught a you know a couple of things from the early like 1900s to mid 1900s that were 
yeah, like things that I, I like, but the thing that the thing they don't say is like, those were the kind of clubs where like, you know, every now and then the police would raid and just like beat the shit out of everybody and put them in jail. And then, you know, like a couple of weeks later it would open up again. So <laughs> I see, I fully expect that, I mean, <laughs> yeah. but that's what I'm saying. I was really surprised. Um, not just that it's introduction in the story, because then I thought, okay, well this could be like, you know, a, a one-off or, or whatever. But then in reading the afterward that, that this was kind of a, a big thing um, yeah. at that time. And I just don't historically see it as, um, you know, whatever acceptable that this would be prevalent in society. So it was, it was kind of uh, it was kind of interesting. And, and I'll tell you, man, I, I would love to see that 1940 style. Yeah, totally. Um, Reminds me of that David Mamet book we just read where there was, what was the name of that? Like the only Chicago? place. Chicago. <laughs> yeah, I know yeah. the name of the book. Oh, gotcha. There's the name of that club. Oh, the that's whorehouse. Right, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, um, not that this was a whorehouse. Carrying on that thought, I want to get your idea on this because I didn't really solidify a thought about this. And uh, if this is too spoilery, we'll cut it out. But um, the Bohemians, one of the things about um, when the, when they're, we're talking about getting girls to go to this like weird camp out thing um, was that there was, it was supposed to be no women allowed. And I thought it like, it sounded casual, like, Oh, this is just, this is a, a men's only club. So it, that's why it's no women allowed. But did, did that ever change for you throughout the book at any point? Like did that no women allowed thing mean anything different later on? No, and and I, I I know what you're getting at, and I don't think it's spoilery because at one point they're they're accused of like dressing up with women and and having sex with one another, right? Yeah, I got the feeling that that was just like a weird allegation, and not that that's something that was actually witnessed by anybody. Okay, so you don't think it was like a rich gay club? No, Mm-mm. I have something. Maybe I'll talk about it in spoiler talk. Okay. Maybe I'll turn your mind around on that. Awesome. Yeah. Um. So. I don't know. I think we've we've. Is there anything else we should, we should touch on here? Um, no, no. I think I think we've covered everything that needs covering. Um, the story itself is. Uh, I mean, it's a little bit of a roller coaster ride, but it is always like I feel with all Christopher Moore books, it's all about the characters. So very, very character driven. I don't get terribly attached to the stories, and and I don't really think most people would in this situation know that this is something that uh, at least I think you would read for the characters, for the interaction, and for the fact that Christopher Moore can still do like a PG thirteen rated funny, um, maybe yeah. better than anybody else that, that that I've read. I'll give you that, and um, I guess it bears acknowledging. So the book is called Noir, and so it is written kind of in that noir-ish fashion with like the femme fatale and like you know you got the like so the but the main character uh fits into more of a down on his luck guy kind of protagonist than you know the the detect the know-it-all detective or not know-it-all but like the swaggering detective kind of Mm -hmm. of thing so um he's the guy that's got nothing and um like things typically don't go his way and it's that kind of brand of noir that's that's kind of the theme that goes throughout this book but it's it's not like it, it at any point it breaks it it stays that way but it just gets a little bit weirder like as you <laughs> as you, as you go it gets weirder and weirder yeah it's it's uh, i forget what he called it in the thing it's goofy noir though but he, he had a term for it in the afterward oh. um yeah he did damn because yeah, even he too. knows he knows that like <laughs> yeah we called it noir uh, perky noir. Perky what noir. What he ended yeah. up with is essentially perky noir, and that's probably a pretty good description <laughs> of, of what you're going to get here. Yeah. So you want to head over to do some spoiler talk before we do our rounds? I want you to convince me they're all rich gay men, so we're totally going to yeah. go over to spoiler talk, which Excellent. is available to all of our patrons at patreon.com slash booked for as little as $1 a month. You get access to a little bit of bonus content here and there, and our gratitude, and, and I will toast toast you, uh, even though you won't see it next time I'm on a New Orleans trip. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, new Patreon perk. All right, we're going to head over to Spoiler Talk. You're going to hear us in about a half a second. And we're back from Spoiler Talk, in which Rob successfully convinced me that the Bohemians were all rich gay men. <laughs> like, really quick, too. 
didn't take much. Yeah, no, it didn't. So um, if you're dying to find out how, patreon.com slash booked, even a dollar a month um, gets you access to not just the spoiler talk we just did, but all of the spoiler talk. And actually, I just remembered we were talking about this recently. Um, we did other special content for Patreon that I totally forgot about. We did live readings or not live readings, but like recorded like audio book kind of things of stories that you and I wrote. Yeah, that was, uh, that was early on in the Patreon days. So yeah, I had to, re- so <laughs> during, um, during recently, whatever I, I brought Rob copies of those stories, um, that I had in a printed chap book and Rob was like, Holy shit. And Jesse and Misty were here. So it was during our seven year anniversary celebration yeah. weekend, whatever. And I brought copies for them essentially, Rob had said something. I was like, oh, no, you guys have probably heard these if you listen to them on Patreon because both of our stories were. <laughs> the ones I we totally read, forgot, dude. Them. So, yeah, original fiction from Rob and Livius um, as read <laughs> by Rob and Livius available at patreon.com slash booked for as little as one dollar per month. Yeah. Um, I, I think with Christopher Moore books, I tend to highlight um, quotes. And I know that we've kind of wandered away from quotes. But is there anything that stands out that you wanted to uh you know, and as a quote, um, I did a lot of quotes too. I know I did a lot of them late because even as I was highlighting them, I was like, that's super spoilery, but I don't care because it's great. So let me, uh, let me take a quick look and see <laughs> if there's anything I want to, I'm going to get, I got a couple. Um, and this one illustrates the fact that like to a degree, this book was breaking the fourth wall, not necessarily by directing directly speaking to, um, its readers, but by referencing things that it would be impossible to know at the time that the book take play, takes place. And um, I know that was a really long-winded thing to say, but um, here's a quote and you'll get what I mean. As the tall man bounced off the wall, he was caught by the throat by an even taller, bigger figure who lifted him against the wall and held him there in a way that was in fashion long ago in a galaxy far away. So a Star Wars reference in a book that takes place in the 1940s. Yeah, very good. I didn't even, I didn't even catch that. Um, I, I love this. Uh, I don't even know where to start this. So um, they're talking about the cheese. And it says, it's not that a lone dame never came into Sal's. It's just that one never came in this early while it was still light out. And the haze of hooch hadn't settled on everyone to smooth over a doll's rougher edges. Light being the natural enemy of the bar broad. <laughs> <laughs> that is goddamn yeah, hilarious. So good. It's so funny. Um, quick description of the general. Uh, an Air Force general with so many campaign medals on his uniform that it looked like someone was losing a game of Mahjong on his chest. Yeah, I like that one too. Yeah. And then this one, we were talking about the kid's um, mom. Uh, the kid's dad was killed in the war, and although I've never seen his ma, she seems to keep busy looking after various uncles. If she is not a professional, it is a safe bet that she's a very hardworking amateur. <laughs> God damn it, that's hilarious. Yeah, that's very good. Um, here's a little thing about Sal. Uh, Sal was well known in the neighborhood, but also well known to be such a douchebag that no one would have been surprised to see a long red rubber hose and nozzle trailing out his pant leg. <sighs> um, so Christopher Moore. We talked about the kid and his uh, his misuse of words. And, and this is just one instance. It's probably like I don't know, the fourth or fifth time. I was like, this is just funny. I have to, to mark this. So. Um, so this first part is the kid. And uh, he's being sent away. Because yeah, uh, Sammy tells me as a date at this time of day, you ain't even going to put your time in on the heavy bag. You're going to go soft, you cream puff. Go ahead. Give it a shot. I'll bet you can't even put in a good 10 minutes with me coaching you. When the Martians get here, you'll fold like a furlong. That's a unit of measurement, eighth of a mile. No, it ain't. And you're a dirty lion furlong for saying. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Very good yeah, stuff. Absolutely. Um, go ahead and uh, kick off a wrap up, then, buddy. All right, this is gonna be a super short wrap up because uh, we've reviewed what five or six uh, Christopher Moore books already on the podcast, and anybody who's listened to any of those knows that I always enjoy these books. And by by what we've said already, it's pretty obvious. I really enjoyed this too. Um, I will say that it was a little bit. Uh, 
like backed off of the Christopher Moore character. And um, like, you know, it just felt a little bit more like subdued for a Christopher Moore book had a little bit of a slow start. So um, I wouldn't put it at my absolute favorite Moore book, but I mean, God damn, it's just a really good story and, and just well-crafted. And I think he was, he was leaning serious on this one on purpose. And I think he was, he was trying to be more story driven while still injecting his, like his own, you know, style and everything. Um, so I was going to give it four stars, but I talked myself up to four and a half. Oh, Rob, you're a fucking shit talking accordion is what you are. And here's why. <laughs> Um, Lamb is my favorite Christopher Moore book, which in many cases, I mean, it's the first book I read from him. And I know that that, at least for me, is a trend. A lot of times my introduction to somebody's um, style that I really enjoy tends to be my favorite. Um, I would put this at a close second. <clears throat> I like that uh, he backed off a little bit of the supernatural stuff in, in some cases, although I still think they're funny and endearing. That stuff goes a little over the top for me. I'm not saying that I don't enjoy. I've enjoyed all but one Christopher Moore book. But this one, I think the more grounded element um, really worked. I, I actually would like, would have liked to, and would in some point like to see one that really just goes straight. No supernatural, no nothing um, other than regular people. Because I think that he could sell it on the quality of his relationships and interactions between people. I don't know that he needs all the extra, the the extra kind of um, even hokey at times uh, story mechanics uh, that he introduces. Um, I really, really like this book a lot. I'm not going to say much else. I'm going to go full, full out five stars on this one. Man, you make it sound like you want to give Christopher Moore some razzmatazz. God damn it! All of it was so good. I give the razzmatazz. And, and again, like the second or third time, I'm like, this is going to get old. Nope. The word Rasmataz for sex did not get old through the course of the book. It's Never just, got old. Yeah. <laughs> All <sighs> right. So it's another one in the books, man. That's another one in the books. And I, 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 I'm looking at my shelf. There's so many. We've done, we have to have done five. This has to be the fifth or sixth Christopher Moore book, I'm guessing. Yeah, and we'll probably continue to keep doing them because um, there are those times. There are times where we read things for the podcast because we do it for the podcast. And then there are those times where we don't even have to be like, are we going to do this book? Like, it's just a given. And Christopher yep. Moore is uh, is in that category. Like, I think back to Chicago and you're like, oh, David Mamet, kind of a big deal. There's a book about Chicago. And I'm like, yeah, all right, we'll do this one for the podcast. Yep. You know what I mean? Fifty Shades of Grey. I go, well, yeah, all right, we should probably do this for the podcast. You know, this this is just, this is fun. This is stuff I would read on my own. Like, I don't need, you know, the, the podcast nudge to read this. This is something I would have been buying on Amazon an hour from now when it comes out at midnight. You know, my pre-order would have gone through. I would have woken up to an email saying your Christopher Moore book is ready, and I'd have been reading it on lunch tomorrow. So Yeah, yeah. <sighs> so... One of the reasons that, actually the reason that our episode is going up a couple of days late is, Livius, you were, what is it? The Big Easy? Is that the name of New Orleans? It is. It is the Big Easy. You were in the Big Easy. Yeah. So um, I'm not going to share a lot about the trip. I mean, there just wasn't a lot. <laughs> I, I will say this. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about a, a just a weird thing at the airport. But I didn't realize that we were going there. Um, the day after WrestleMania. <laughs> okay. Was WrestleMania so, in New Orleans? Yeah. On Sunday oh. night, WrestleMania was, was in New Orleans. Um, so this is mentioned to us by the Uber driver who's really excited because she's like, Oh, the WrestleMania was here last night and I've been getting tons of rides, you know, back and forth from the airport and whatever to, you know, people coming in, people leaving people, you know, going from, their hotel in the French Quarter to the, I think it's the Superdome or wherever, where WrestleMania was, you know, yeah. and she was super excited about how much money she made. And I was like, oh, that's cool. WrestleMania was here. I'd seen some people post on social media about, you know, they're excited to watch it or, or whatever. But I don't, I was a wrestling fan as a kid and I still, there are a few, you know, wrestlers I hear like news about and I get, you know, concerned or excited. Like Ric Flair was in the hospital not that long ago and I was super concerned. I mean, it's somebody I really, you know, worshipped as a kid. But God damn it, man, these people walking around and you could tell because fucking if you went to WrestleMania, there was not a way that you were not wearing some type of wrestling paraphernalia the day after. And uh, God, I got to tell you, it was not a pretty fucking crowd in uh, in NOLA 
there the day after WrestleMania. Were you thinking like, man, I, I don't know what's going to happen the day that WrestleMania happens the same time as the gathering of the Juggalos? <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Well, I, you know, there would be some confusion on for some of those people on what to wear. Well, yeah. like how, how do you do or, that? Do and you... what, which event to go to? Right. No shit. So, uh, so yeah, that was kind of interesting though. And there were thousands of them. And I uh, think a lot of people I wound up subsequently finding out is, um, the, the WWE also has a live show Monday night raw. And, and I yeah. guess they did it in new Orleans where all of them were already there the night before for WrestleMania. Something a lot of just stayed on for that event too. I mean, I would have, you know, stayed on for two events if if I was, you know, that was something I was willing to go to. Um, but oh my god, not a good looking crowd. The <laughs> WrestleMania, the WrestleMania people, Jesus. Um, like how'd they get all the Walmart um, yeah. uh, customers all in the same oh place? Oh my god, man, it's it was it was rough. Um, the other thing, this is kind of interesting. Um, the last time you flew was what October was it when you came back from from um, L.A. Or from, I'm sorry, from wherever you were in California. Yeah, September, for the beginning of September. Yeah. Now, I, I flew a little bit after that in October when I was in New Orleans, and TSA security was the same thing it, it's been for years, right? Shoes off, laptops out, liquids out, right? All that yeah, stuff. Yeah, take your belt off, that kind of thing. Yeah, so we're, we're at O'Hare, and uh, to make a long story short, we wind up getting taken to a different security line for a, a shorter wait. And when we get there, there's all like 15 people ahead of us. And the guy goes, he's really laid back. He's like, all right, folks, listen, this is going to be really easy today. You don't have to take your shoes off. You don't have to take anything out of your bags. Make sure your pockets are empty. Uh, you don't even have to take off your belt unless you've got like a big belt buckle. Just come on through and <laughs> let's just keep it moving. It's like, oh, this is a little weird because I'm thinking we just got taken to a security line that isn't very long. Like if you had a long security line, I could see like suspending that because people are going to miss their flights or, or whatever. Right. It's like, well, that's fucking weird. Fast forward four days, we're in um, the the New Orleans airport, the Louis Armstrong International Airport, and there's a significantly long line, <laughs> the longest line I've seen um, in that part of the terminal. And I've been in New Orleans not, like 15 times now. Um, <laughs> and the lady walks by and she's like, all right, folks, today you don't have to take off your shoes. You don't have to take anything out of your bag. Like we have gone from – everyone walking around in their socks in the airport to <laughs> two different airports on two different days, just being like, now that other shit we've been doing, just fuck it. Just get on your plane. Just get on your plane and good luck. So it's kind of weird. It was nice in a way, but it was also a little concerning. Like we went from this super high level of security to like, no, nah, nothing. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't know. What to, I don't know what to say about that. Can I also um, tell you, and now this is proven, that if you try to take fudge on an airplane, <laughs> inevitably they want to make sure that your fudge is not a plastic explosive. What do they like? Taste it? No, but they open it up and look at it. They're like, "Are you sure this is fudge?" Well, first of all, you get a look because you've got like two fucking pounds of fudge because <laughs> there's something fucking wrong with you. So they're fat shaming you before they yeah. suspect you of being a bomber. But, you know, the first time I was like, the fudge, it's just weird. And then I thought, oh, my God, that looks exactly like in every movie where the guy's got the plastic explosives, right? Like yeah. you just got this brick of clay that you slap up against something, right? So so, <laughs> so next time when I get fudge in New Orleans, I'm going to throw like some like short pencil size things in the box <laughs> with the fudge, too. And some just like wire, some string or something. Yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Some. some some uh, jewelry um, um, wire, you know, just yeah. like some little metal. Yeah, perfect. I think that's a really solid plan. Uh, yeah. well, they're so lax at the airport now, they might not even care. They'd be like, oh, <laughs> how come you only like have two pounds of fudge, fudge, buddy? Yeah. So, at any rate. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, New Orleans was uh, was nice and a very uh, relaxing and much needed restful break from this fucking podcast. I did. Yeah, I know. It's um, it, it's rough being on this podcast. I did get my customary uh, photo from Livius where he's drinking something in an ungodly early hour. Um, so that felt nice. That And I think it was more of a reminder like, hey, asshole, I know that you're dumb about what's going on in the world. So just don't bother me while I'm in New Orleans. I feel like that's what that was. And I do. I totally uh, turn off, too, because I get messages from people and I'm like, I'm not even responding to this. Like, I really try to, like, shut off everything when I'm uh, when I'm there. I think I respected your your, your I, yeah, absolutely. No, and I, I yeah, yeah, yes, you did. Good. Um, 
that being said, we should probably go into uh, some we, we've been covering on this podcast for a while now, which seems kind of weird. But there have been a, a number of uh, of celebrity passings. Um, yeah, there's a um, one, there's one that happened today, and there's one that happened the other day that uh, I think both hit us in different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll let you do the first one. So, uh, not somebody we mentioned on the podcast a lot, not somebody I knew a ton about, but, um, coast to coast AM's art bell died. Um, we really started talking about him, um, when we were doing like the conspiracy theory episode, I think, and maybe yeah. the time travel episode. Um, but that guy is, uh, just, just a, a staple in, let's say necessarily conspiracy theory culture, but in supernatural culture. And some of that is conspiracy theorist, mm-hmm. right? Like the aliens and stuff. But uh, he died. And and I, although I wasn't a, a somebody who spent a lot of time listening to him, I was kind of familiar with him. I knew who he was. And I respected um, that he made a career out of, you know, investigating or interviewing people who, um, uh, you know, who were, who were people that probably couldn't get airtime anywhere else. At least they couldn't when um, when he started doing this. So now, you know, through the advent of YouTube and podcast or whatever, um, there are uh, dozens of shows just like Coast to Coast. Um, but he was really, I think, an originator in that. So I'm a little sad at his passing. Yeah, I, I, I never really knew much about him. I will say that there's probably one time that I can actually remember hearing any of the show and it's really weird because it was um when i was visiting my father in alaska i think i was what 14 or 15 years old and um that just happened to be like what he was playing on the radio my father um before it was like time to go to sleep or whatever so um i was like this is really fucking weird and that was my only impression and it was <laughs> in a weird setting anyway um in in alaska in the summer when i was like 14 so yep. that's that's it that's all i know yeah so uh rest in peace art bell um i'd like to say you're you'd be missed but i didn't really listen to your stuff very much but i know know that i was thinking about you when i saw that yeah i'll tell you the one that hits home for me uh, that just happened today, so uh, a couple days ago when, when this episode is released, is Harry Anderson died. Yeah, I uh, I found out about this because Rob said, dude, you know it hit me really hard. Harry Anderson died. And I was like, holy shit, the guy from Night Court? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So yeah. I just remember, again, I'm going to go back to my childhood. Um, Harry, all right, so Night Court and Cheers played back to back on like WGN or whatever. This is a whole Chicago thing. And it lined up in a way where I believe Night Court was technically after my bedtime at a bedtime when this thing was airing, Livius. And so like we'd get I'd get sent me and my brother, my brother is a year older than me. We'd get sent to bed and we were just dying to watch Night Court for some reason. That was just what, we, you know, I think it's cuz we couldn't, you know. And um and so like yeah fucking night court man was my was my jam back in the day, and um uh I recently I want to say the beginning of the year there was one point where iTunes had the first season of Night Court for sale for um like five dollars, and it was like a full season I think it was like twenty five episodes or whatever, and uh, oh I'm sorry thirteen but it was you know it was a normal season. And so I bought it, and then I just like fell down this rabbit hole of watching Night Court, and I bought like up to season four, I think, and I was rewatching all of them, and really took me back. And the thing that I re- didn't remember, I remembered all the funny hijinks and stuff like that, but mm-hmm. like that show was super serious. Like there were moments where like Harry was like this, he was the goofy guy and everything, but like with like this real heart of gold, and and like all he cared about was making sure that people were like okay. And stuff, and so I never caught that on the original because I was like a kid. But like that Harry Anderson character, his judge, what was his what was his character's name? Harry. Yeah, right? it was Harry. Um, Harry Stone. Yeah, was like this super softy who just wanted to like help everybody in life. So, yeah. I um I really liked uh, I really liked that show um as well. Um, oh God, what was his name? The guy that played the the prosecutor. 
John Larroquette, uh, yes, Dan, yeah. Dan Fielding. God, I love that character yeah. so much. And and I was in that same boat where I was watching it. Uh, I think I might have been watching it. You were watching it in reruns. I'm pretty sure I was watching Night Court in its original run. Yeah. Um, on whatever ABC or whatever it was on CBS. Um, yeah. So I really liked that show. I didn't realize he was on Cheers. I never liked Cheers. Um, but yeah, sometimes it would kind of be on in the background or that was the only thing on, but I was usually like doing something else. Like I never paid much attention to cheers. It wasn't my, my sort of humor at the time or, or now for that, um, for, for that matter. <laughs> so, um, so I was surprised he was in cheers, but yeah, again, it was, uh, uh, it was the only like things he ever did. I think he kind of disappeared off the face of the earth after that. Right. I'm not gonna say he wasn't in anything, but that was really his. He had a solid run on something called Dave's world, which I think was based on that Dave Barry writer guy from like i don't know new york times magazine or something like that um no idea like a what a, comedy yeah. writer kind of dude hmm, interesting yeah but really night court was his thing yeah yeah so um again not really reading related but uh um you know things that were near and dear to us uh you know in some way so that was uh that was uh you know eh, that one caught me off guard yeah yeah but it was like sixty five, so yeah. Yeah, I mean that's not very old. I mean our bell was seventy two and, and nowadays that's not you know, that's yeah, not terribly he wasn't old. Even in his eighties. <laughs> yeah, well yeah, you know, so um but on to uh something to look forward to, maybe, depending on where you're at. Um Jonathan Mayberry, um, who's one of his books we reviewed here that Dead of we, Night. Dead of Night. Yep. Um, that we enjoyed many years ago, and I, I was a fan, longtime fan of his Joe Ledger series, which I have uh, just not kept up with over the last few years. Um, he's his drama series V Wars, which I believe, and uh, I know somebody's already listening, going, "No, you motherfucker!" It was an actual book. I think was a um, uh, graphic novel. Mm. Yeah, he did a lot of graphic novels. Yeah, or does I guess is has been uh, commissioned by Netflix for a 10-episode series. Um, the more Im- the more important thing there is that Ian Somerhalder, <laughs> Somerhalder, I don't know, whatever, is starring it. Do you know what he is famous for, Rob? I, well, I know what you told me before we started recording. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's from Vampire Diaries and from <laughs> Lost. So uh, that guy, though, on Lost, I will tell you, was like the biggest pussy. Um, and then when I saw these, so I started watching Vampire Diaries. I was like, "Oh, this pussy!" And now yeah, he's a fucking badass and a really cool character on uh, on Vampire Diaries. So that's uh, that's something for us to look forward to in the near future. Uh, maybe maybe episode three of uh, of the View. Oh wow! I see what you're doing here. Mm-hmm. All right, all right. Well, <laughs> I'll find a creative way to shoot that down. Do um, you want to talk about what's in the nearest future for for our listeners? No, what I do want to talk about is I was thinking about you while I was on vacation. You know, sometimes you just don't feel like doing something because you've been going all day. I was yeah. sitting in the hotel room flipping channels and I wound up watching the second, uh, you know, whatever half of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, <laughs> the movie. Oh, yeah. Now, I don't nice. know. I don't know. I know you were a big fan of the series, which I didn't really care for. I watched like season one and it just wasn't really my thing. Um how, where are you at on on the original on on the actual canon on the movie Buffy the Vampire Slayer? <laughs> I like that you call that the actual canon. Um, mm-hmm. I wa- I own it, and I watched it probably in the last year, and it's okay. Um, I think it kind of I don't think it captures like the real vision of what Buffy the Vampire Slayer was. But and it was super campy, like super super campy. Oh, for sure, yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I was surprised because um, I put it on. And I was like, "Oh, this is gonna feel super dated, and I'm gonna hate this." I was a huge fan of that movie when it came out, like 1990, maybe 91, 92, whatever it was. Um, and uh, you know, I I I felt uh, I still felt that it was very enjoyable. Um, you know, like so what I saw the last forty minutes of it or something on on cable. I, I'm I'm a little surprised right now. I did a little research. I wanted to see who was involved with the movie. So, Fran Rubel Kazui, Kuzi Kuzui, is the person who I don't know. Okay. The person uh, who directed Buffy the Vampire Slayer the the movie with um what's her name Christy Swanson or whatever Brinkley. Yes, Christy Swanson. <laughs> uh. 
was uh, produced, did production and exec, executive production on both Buffy the Vampire Slayer and the spinoff series Angel. So, um, eventually came around to the series, which is kind of I, I was I'm, I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, I, I honestly didn't either. Um, but I was surprised at the cast of that movie. Like I'd forgotten. <laughs> Fucking Luke uh, Perry. Yeah, but I mean, like, I remember Paul Rubens and, yeah, Luke Perry, but, like, Donald, yeah. S- Donald Sutherland, yeah. Rutger Hauer. Rutger Hauer's um, in it. Fucking yeah, Hillary Swank Hillary is Swank's in, in it. it. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, it's it's really, <laughs> I, I've got it pulled up now, David Arquette. Yeah. Um, That that movie had a lot of people. Um, Fucking Stephen Root's in it, wow. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It, it was a, it was a up-and-coming cast in some ways. Yeah. But then, I mean, you've got Rutger Hauer and Donald Sutherland. I mean, you've got some some big time heavy hitters too. Oh wow, that, Tom so. Jane's in that. Oh, I didn't even catch that. Wow, dude, yeah, yeah, big cast. Yeah, the Rutger Hauer, that, yeah, like yeah. now, I mean, he's in stuff like Hobo with a Shotgun. But back then, well, yeah, Rutger Hauer was a huge one of my favorite movies, yeah. man. The Hitcher, the Hitcher. Yeah. Never yeah, Ben time. Affleck was in that too, and he's actually uncredited. But I did see because that's about when I turned it on. That scene when they're at the basketball game. Yeah, I turned it on just before that, and I was like, "Hey, that's fucking Ben Affleck." I didn't know he was in that, but yeah, he's uncredited on IMDb. <laughs> Seth Green. I mean, there's Ricky Lake. Fucking <laughs> Ricky Lake's in it. Wow, dude, un- these people are uncredited. That's crazy. Well, yeah. They were nobodies at the time. I'm guessing slash. From Guns N' Roses. <laughs> I mean, like, you can't. Like, this this cast is is all-star. Wow. Yeah. He was the DJ. Look at that. Yep. Yep. All right. Um, I'll, I mean, I would watch it again. I, 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 It was fine, but it's just, I prefer the series. Yeah. How, what do you think about that reboot they're talking about? It's never going to happen. All right. All right, we've dragged this on long enough. Um, Next up, I think we mentioned it at the top of the episode, but uh, another book. Book. uh, I'm only. I was only excited about three books this year, (laughs) Um, and we reviewed one tonight, and we're reviewing one next week. Unbury Carol by uh, Josh Mallerman. Can I just say that I think a book called Unbury Carol would catch my attention, even if it wasn't by Mallerman. Like it would be enough for it. That would be enough for me to go and like read a synopsis at least just based on the title. So sometimes books are titled wonderfully noir. Not so much. Unbury Carol. Great title. Did you read the synopsis for this? No. Did you plan to before you start reading it? No, but I can. I mean, I'm not opposed to it. I just, I've gotten out. I just don't do it. I don't know what it is. If I know we're reviewing a book, I'm like, I don't need to read the synopsis. Well, I bought a physical copy and it's got the synopsis in the book jacket and I read it and I was kind of surprised by the, the actual plot of it. So I'm happy to read it if, unless you don't, unless you want to go. No, no, go ahead. Please do. It's a Western, right? Yeah. So Carol Evers is a woman with a dark secret. She has died many times, but her many deaths are not final. They are comas, a waking slumber indistinguishable from death, each lasting days. Only two people know of Carol's eerie condition. One is her husband, Dwight, who married Carol for her fortune, and when she lapses into another coma, plots to seize it by proclaiming her dead and quickly burying her alive. The other is her lost love, the infamous outlaw James Moxie. When word of Carol's dreadful fate reaches him, Moxie rides the trail again to save his beloved from an early, unnatural grave. And all the while, awake and aware, Carol fights to free herself from the crippling darkness that darkness that binds her, summoning her own fierce will to survive. As the players in this drama of life and death fight to decide her fate, Carol must, in the end, battle to save herself. A haunting story of a woman literally bringing herself back from the dead. Unbury Carol is a twisted take on the Sleeping Beauty fairy tale that will stay with you long after you've turned the final page. Holy shit. Well, I was interested before, and I am even more interested now. Uh, wow. Well, yeah, wow. Um, so let's see what I've taken from that is that is uh, just as fucking weird as every other Mallerman <laughs> thing I've ever read. Yeah. Um, but also very different from all the other Mallerman stuff in scope. So everything we've read from him has been very, very different from any other thing we've read from him. Right. And uh, this continues that trend. Pretty, yeah. I'm excited to get get reading on it. 
Um, and we're going to do just that. So um, that's it for this week. Uh, thanks again for listening. Until next time, I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. Keep reading.